Tom, Tom Holt, HoneyNet Project, take it away. Just whatever. Well, thank you everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for letting me uh, speak today. The Spartan Devils project is a little different than some of the other projects in the, uh, our other chapters in the project in that our focus is largely on social issues in hacking and attacks and malware rather than looking at technical analyses or attempts to defeat different types of attacks our interest is in understanding the attackers at a very very deep level so what I'm going to walk you through today are some of the different things that we're doing to understand attackers from a social science point of view I'm a criminologist by training and Max Kilger who's part of our chapter as well as a psychologist so our technical skills are, are a little different than others a lot of its bootstrapped particularly in my Case, so I don't have any formal technical training. So what we'll present might be kind of a divergence from what you've heard, so feel free at any point to ask questions and, well, excuse me, we'll try to keep questions at the end, but I'll try to roll through this as quickly as I can. So just to start, one of the things that we're doing is a project that's funded by the National Institute of Justice to look at stolen data markets. There's a lot of interest in terms of how individuals are stealing data through mass compromises and otherwise. Our interest is in trying to understand how products acquired through different attempts, whether it's phishing, mass compromise, uh, individual hacks, log sales, whatever the case might be, how those products are sold, how they're marketed, what the marketplace looks like from a human point of view, what are the important things that lead an individual to go with a certain seller, what makes products uh, operate at a specific price point, how can those factors be affected. So all of this is developed in the hopes of trying to come up with some mechanisms to mitigate or at least uh, deal with the marketplace from a non-technical fashion. So engaging in slander attacks, trying to disrupt the market through uh, misinformation or disinformation, and trying to combine all of this in a meaningful way. So over the last year we've been going into Russian and uh, English language carding forums. We've actually been registering, creating accounts, and downloading large amounts of posts and reading through it, trying to understand what's going on within these markets. We've collected from a lot of different sites, and what I'm going to walk you through today are some preliminary analyses that we've been able to do comparing both English language and Russian language boards to see what the differences are in terms of products and pricing. So if you've never seen one of these forums before, here's an example of what an ad might look like. And this is from one of the boards we're in called Omuerta. So this person is selling uh, credit cards. He says that I've got CVVs for sale. If you really want to buy, please contact me through a specific email address or through ICQ. Except for CVVs, I have uh, track one and track two data, which is uh, on the back of the magnetic strip on the card. Uh, and if you're not familiar, CVVs are that little three-digit account on the back of any card. Uh, he's got dumps, which are different kinds of accounts, PayPal logins that are verified with high balances, and bank logins as well. So this might be the username, password, secret questions for different banks. Uh, I don't want to talk more. I can lower my price for you. Just read clearly and contact me if you want to buy. And then this is just one part of his pricing list for uh, CVVs. And you can see that the price varies based on the location and the type of card that we're dealing with. So US uh, Visa and MasterCards are $2 uh, per one. Uh, if you want American Express and Discover, they're $5. And the price goes up from there depending on locale or where you want information to come from. And so with this kind of tiered pricing structure, we've seen it across different forums and different products. We want to understand what might be driving some of these differences and how is this related to seller reputation. And just to give you a sense from a sample of uh, seven forums today with a comparison of three Russian and four English, we see some variation in what's being sold. On the English language side, uh, CVVs are the most common product sold, while on the Russian side, it's dumps. We have a lot more data from the English language uh, sites at this point because we have to work with certified translators to actually get the Russian data into English so we can go through it. So it's kind of a slow process. If we could find ways to automate this, we'd love to, but it's kind of hard to do. But, you know, that's something later on, please talk to me because that would be great. Uh, dumps are, however, kind of common in the English language boards, along with cash out services to actually exfiltrate money from accounts. Uh, that's not as prevalent in the Russian side, though we also see people selling skimmers. Uh, and if you're familiar with the skimmer, it's the device you clip onto an ATM to actually capture track data or the magnetic strip data. So they're available in different places, just in different quantities. 
And in terms of the regions affected, we also see a little bit of variation here as well, but not much. The U.S. is the number one target across both our English and our Russian language boards. However, the U.K. is second in the English grouping, whereas uh, the U.K. is uh, fourth on the Russian side of things. We've had to kind of classify things a little bit unusually because not every seller specifies where their products come from. So you might see World International on the Russian side, the EU on the English side, because that's the way in which the seller lists information. So we've had to dump things into big buckets to try to do some of this work. And in looking just a little bit at price variations with uh, the cost of services, taking the U.S. data with CVVs being the most common products sold. This is an example of an ad for CVV services. You can see uh, here their pricing is uh, a bit tiered. So U.S. Uh, Visa and MasterCards are $3. If you want to buy more than 50, the price goes down to $2 and you have to order a minimum of 50. You can see that they offer these bulk discounts. Pricing goes down as your volume increases. And we see this across the board, both in the English and Russian sides. Within this data set, we're seeing the average price for CVVs being $25.99. So it's relatively inexpensive. When you contrast that against dumps, which are the most common in the Russian side and second in the U.S., the pricing is a little bit higher. The mean for dumps is $101.44. And the amount of information that comes on a dump can vary pretty substantially. And uh, the type of card that you're buying also seems to affect pricing. You can see it starts with uh, U.S. data, $15 for Visa and MasterCards, uh, $30 for Visa MasterCards that are gold and platinum, $40 for business cards, and then $25 for Amex and Discover. And the price goes up substantially when you get into uh, products from the EU. So it's $75 for a classic or standard, $100 for gold and platinum. And uh, some of these sellers also specify how many of their accounts are valid. In other words, if you're buying from this person, 80 to 90% of what you buy is going to be usable right up front. Uh, we're seeing just a little bit of evidence to suggest that validity is going to affect pricing and the number of individuals who go to a specific seller. So those who offer more valid products are going to get a higher rate of return and a higher audience overall. This is something that is ongoing, so we're going to keep this up for probably the next year or so. So you'll see occasional products trickling out of, of this study. And if uh, you have any questions about this later, please feel free to ask me. Another thing that we are doing is trying to see if there are any particular factors that can predict both the creation of malicious software and then the level of infections. If the individual user is quite a concern, but we're also seeing server level infections that are, are a significant problem, whether it's an exploit pack or an iframe or something else, we want to see if there's anything that could account for infection rates and how they might vary by place. This is kind of a different way of thinking about attacks rather than trying to defend, it's seeing if there's something that might drive an individual to target a specific country over another. And in trying to do this kind of research, it's not necessarily easy. There's not a lot of open source data repositories that we can go to to find good things. We've tried to work with certs, we've tried to contact different AV vendors, and we're not having a lot of success getting good data. So we've had to turn to the open source uh, marketplace. How many of you are familiar with the malware domain list? A couple of you? Okay, good. So since all their data is archived and it's easy to download, we've gone to their data from 2009 to 2011 inclusive. And we've created a, a specific type of analysis, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. We're trying to combine this with macro level data from different countries using the CIA World Factbook and Freedom House, which provides information about political freedom and rights within a given country. So taking malicious software infections as our dependent variable, we've come up with a variety of independent variables trying to predict infections. Now this is based on a theoretical framework in criminology called routine activities theory, which argues that uh, individuals have to have both a motivated offender, a suitable target, and an absence of guardians in order for a crime to occur. If we think of malicious software infections as a crime, there are certain routine behaviors that might make a victim or a target more suitable than another. So these variables are attempts to operationalize what makes a target more attractive than another. 
With macro level data, however, the problem is that a lot of things are correlated and multicollinearity makes models hard to run. So we've had to leave out a lot of good things that might actually be useful predictors like say a uh, number of cell phones, number of landlines, things that could help us as technology predictors in favor of other measures. So you can see we have uh, log GDP, the log number of internet hosts, uh, the number of internet users, log population size, uh, average age of a country's population. Question? Uh, no, we haven't looked at currency evaluation. That is something that could definitely matter. Uh, we're trying to find good metrics for a variety of different things, and that's not necessarily in the CIA fact book as a, as a useful measure, but it's something that we could certainly try to do. This is also something that's very exploratory. We're still working out the kinks in these models, but that's an excellent question. Uh, political rights is something that we also thought might matter with regard to individual freedoms. If uh, individuals feel that they can post anything anywhere online, that might make it easier for individuals to throw up malware because it might be less likely to be detected, whereas in more restrictive regimes it might be harder to get something up due to excessive filtering or difficulties with content. And then finally, religion is something that we included to see if that might have any influence whatsoever in terms of targeting. And taking the malware domain list data, with three years' worth of information, we get a range of individuals who are reporting infections. For the U.S., this is the number one grouping within the data. So this uh, number here, 19,559 reported infections. It's about 17 a day. So the U.S. is the most likely targeted. And then it ranges from here. There are a lot of countries, however, that are not included, so they are zero infections over a three-year window. And this creates a, a question as to how do you make the analysis work? So we've had to do something called a zero inflated negative binomial regression. If you're a quantoid or a stat head, this is basically a way to run an analysis to see both what predicts the counts, so the number of times something occurs, and then it also gives you the ability to see what makes something a definite zero, why is it not in the data set? And then what makes it a one? So what factors are going to lead to differences in non-zeros and one, or non-zeros and zeros? So within that zero prediction model, we only find two things to be significant, political rights and log internet users. So what does that mean? The number uh, based on rankings from uh, Freedom House, the more restrictive a country's government, the more likely you are to be a certain zero. So very restrictive regimes are very unlikely to have malware infections. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Kind of a different way of looking at it, but it's just a one way to, uh, to try to move ahead. Within the count model, trying to see what factors actually affect the number of times something occurs, we see only two things that matter. First and foremost, it's median age. So the older a population is, the more likely we are to see infections. And then finally, population size as a whole. So the larger a population, the more likely it is to be compromised. So that's a little bit of what we're doing on that end. The final thing that I want to bring to your attention is some research we're doing internationally. And this is something that Max and I presented a little bit last year at the Paris meetings, and we've been working on this subsequently. And it's trying to understand what factors affect individual willingness to engage in political attacks, now whether that's in the real world or offline. We've seen a lot of attention with regard to anonymous, lulsec, various attacks by uh, anonymous entities against large targets. We've seen the Arab Spring and a lot of shifts in internet use and technology adoption. Uh, if you look at the Russia-Estonia conflict and Stuxnet as just uses of malware against nation states, what we're running into is now this problem of individual users being able to cause significant damage to a target. And this concept of asymmetric warfare, where a small group of individuals can cause much greater damage to a target over time. So it's a very cost-effective way to engage in attacks, particularly in a cyber environment. With individuals being able to affect governments or nation states in this fashion, it's 
calling to question how individual nation states are going to structure their relationship to citizens and how they're going to deal with this problem of what uh, Kilger and Denning have referred to as the civilian cyber warrior, the individual who can engage in attacks against their nation state or other nation states without any affiliation to a government or otherwise. So this study is trying to see what factors actually might lead a person to act as a civilian cyber warrior. And what kind of relationship, if any, does this have to traditional civil disobedience activities? So say engaging in protests, uh, if you remember the Occupy movement, which has kind of drifted out of the public conscious here in the US, uh, sit-ins, uh, writing letters, whatever kind of campaigns that might be thought of as traditional political activity. And we've been trying to explore this in a variety of different ways. One, we have a data set from the US from a large Midwestern university that I'll leave up to you to guess where that might be. And we've been able to find partners across the globe. Right now, uh, thanks to Julia, we've been able to get some colleagues in Taiwan who've been collecting data. We have researchers in Australia, South Africa, Italy. Uh, the Italian chapter has been able to help us a little bit there. And we're also trying to pull uh, individuals from the UK. We're still looking for prospective collaborators on this. So if you're at all interested in trying to do some cross-national research, we'd love to have you. In terms of the study itself, let me walk you through a little bit about what we've tried to do. We've come up with a four-factor design. So it starts with the target of the attack. Is it going to be your home country or a foreign nation? And then the type of attack that an individual might engage in. Is it going to be cyber-related or is it going to be physical in nature? And how are those two things related? And that leads us to the actual instrumentation. I realize this is kind of small, you may or may not be able to see it, but basically this is the way in which we phrase the question to our respondents. And this is true across the nations that we've been working with so far. It says, imagine that the country that you most closely associate excuse me, as your home country or homeland has recently promoted national policies and taken physical actions that have negative consequences to your home country. These policies and actions have resulted in significant hardships for the people in your country. What actions do you think would be appropriate for you to take against your home country, given their policies and physical actions? You can choose as many actions as you think the situation warrants, and in this scenario, assume you have the necessary skills to carry out the action. So there's a range of responses that individuals could provide and could select. It starts with do nothing. Let your country work it out on its own. 32% of the respondents said, yes, I would just do nothing. Then we have write a letter to your home country's government protesting their actions. 69% of respondents said yes to this. Uh, and then participate in a protest against your home country at an anti-government rally. 62% said that they would be willing to do that. And then protest at your country's, or pardon me, your home country's capital building. 54% said yes. From there we get into a few more questionable behaviors. Uh, from here, it's confront one of your home country's senior government officials about their policies. 29% said that they would do this. Then the last three are very severe. First, sneak into a military base in your home country to write slogans on buildings and vehicles. Only 2.8% were willing to do that. Physically damage an electrical power substation. Only 1.68%. And then the last one, damage a government building in your home country with an explosive device. Only three individuals said yes to that. Now, that's kind of a good thing, right? That means that we don't have a lot of individuals that we need to be worried about. But at the same time, three people is still a pretty good number in terms of responses. That suggests something about a very small cadre of respondents within this data. We then give them the option to engage in attacks or activities in a cyber environment. Starting with do nothing, let your country work it out on its own. 36% said yes to that. Then post a comment on a social networking website like Facebook or Twitter that criticizes your home country's government. 77% said that they were willing to do this. Now admittedly, this might change over time as Twitter and some other social networks are instituting different policies to deal with uh, posts, but at least at the time when we were collecting it, this was not as much of an issue. Next, we have to face the personal website of an important government official. 13% were willing to do that. Uh, to face an important government website for your home country, 12% said yes to that. Uh, compromise the server of a bank and withdraw money to give it to the victims of uh, your country's government 
policies and actions, 4% said yes. Uh, search your home country's government servers for secret papers, kind of a WikiLeaks style attack. There we had 9% say that they would be willing to do it. And then these last three are similar to the last three with regard to physical attacks. Compromise one or more of your home country's military servers that might affect military readiness. Only 16 people said yes. Compromise one of your home country's regional power grids, re resulting in a temporary loss of power. Six respondents said yes. And then finally, compromise a nuclear power plant system that results in a small release of radioactivity. Extreme, right? Three people. Same three. This is a little concerning. On the one hand, good news, not many people willing to do these extreme behaviors, but at the same time, this is still disconcerting that a very small minority would be willing to engage in these extreme activities. Next, uh, we moved into the targeting of a foreign country. Now, given variations in individual beliefs and attitudes in home countries, we had to come up with a measure that would obviate any kind of racial or national stereotypes that might be in place. So we devised a country called Bagaria for the sake of removing any kind of potential individual bias. It says, imagine that the country of Bagaria has recently promoted national policies and taken physical actions that have negative consequences to the country that you most closely associate as your home country or homeland. So it's kind of the same as the first one, only using a foreign entity as the target. So, what actions do you think would be appropriate for you to take against Bagaria, given their policies and actions against your home country? Choose as many as you think the situation warrants. First, do nothing. 42% said they would do nothing. Write a letter to the government of Bagaria. 53% said they'd be willing to do that. Travel to Bagaria and protest at their country's capital building. We have 25%. Uh, travel to Bagaria to confront a senior official. We have 19%. And the number drops off substantially with regard to physical attacks. Again, we have sneak into a military base, uh, damage an electrical power substation, or uh, damage a government building with an explosive device. So a very small number were willing to do these activities. We give them the same response categories with regard to cyber attack. Now here, the overwhelming uh, response category is Facebook and Twitter, posting some kind of message against the Bagarian government. 76% said they'd be willing to do that. 10% uh, were willing to do a web defacement against uh, Bagarian governments. 5% uh, would be willing to engage in a compromise against a bank. And then with regard to that WikiLeaks style question, 9% were willing to uh, access secret papers. And then only one person in the U.S. sample was willing to compromise a nuclear plant. So it's a lot smaller against a foreign target. Now, with all of these responses in mind, we've tried to come up with a few different models to predict different activities. We actually have a paper about this coming out in a journal called Crime and Delinquency, which is one of the top 10 in my field of criminology. And with the model that we're going to present now, we've come up with a variety of different measures trying to see what would predict willingness to engage in multiple attacks. So those who would do nothing, those who would do as many behaviors as is possible. In the homeland attack, with regard to physical attacks, the only predictors for multiple uh, behaviors are being from the U.S., being willing to perform a cyber attack. So there's a definite relationship here between physical and cyber activities. And then finally, a negative relationship to something that we call outgroup antagonism. So those who are more willing to support those in their society who are different from them, who have opposite points of view, religious backgrounds, or otherwise. With regard to cyber attacks, there are a few common relationships that show up, although in this case, homeland being outside of the U.S., so someone who's uh, from a foreign country, is a significant predictor. Being willing to engage in a physical attack is a very strong predictor for cyber attacks. And then engaging in piracy of software or media is a strong predictor as well. So those who would uh, download music or movies over the last 12 months were more likely to engage in cyber attacks or reported a greater willingness. And then finally, those who had more strong feelings of outgroup antagonism. So there's a difference in this outcome. Cyber attackers are somewhat different from physical attackers. When we try to run this model against Bagaria, so in that Bagarian scenario, it's a little different. The only things that matter with regard to physical attacks are an individual's level of technological skill. 
And this is actually a scale based on the ability to use Linux, configure a home network, and another measure of technical sophistication. And then willingness to engage in cyber attack. Now this is kind of an unexpected relationship. It's non-significant in the other models, but to see it as a strong predictor here for physical activity is perhaps indicative of individual interest. Uh, we think it might have something to do with general attitudes towards uh, kind of the hacker community and the spirit of, of individual action against entities. And then for cyber attacks, we see individuals who engage in piracy as a strong predictor, willingness to engage in physical attacks again, and then gender. So males are more likely to report cyber attacks against a foreign government. This relationship isn't present in any of the other ones, so it's, it's kind of questionable. We're still trying to work through this data and run a few different models to see what might matter. What I want to draw to your attention now is one of the good things about doing comparative research. So we have the US data that I just walked you through. Comparing this to a sample of university students from Taiwan, we see some variation in responses. Particularly on these more serious forms of attack, we see a slightly higher willingness to engage in different kinds of attacks against a domestic target, particularly damaging a power substation and damaging a building with explosives. And that's actually approaching significance in terms of a difference between the two. Also, we see a difference with regard to protest behaviors. Whereas in the US sample, it's very common, 62% were willing to do that. It's much lower in the Taiwanese sample. And same with traveling to protest. So these kinds of variations are, are interesting and might suggest some different dynamics at play, which is good to see. This might lead to some questions about different predictors across place. The same is true with regard to cyber attacks. And at the bottom of the scale, those more Oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is the uh, Bagarian physical attack model uh, for Taiwan. We see actual higher levels of a willingness to report here. Sorry for the mislabeled slides. And so there are some differences, again, with regard to protest behavior as well. On the cyber attack end of things, this is the homeland model and we see that there are some differences in reported willingness to compromise a power grid, uh, a little bit higher reporting with regard to compromising a government server, but a lot less responses for individual willingness to post on Facebook. So we see some differences in the dynamics there, and it's consistent within the Bagarian model as well. The individuals from Taiwan are much less likely to use this as a protest vehicle or as a communications vehicle. And they're a lot more willing to compromise military servers and compromise a power grid than those in the U.S. sample, and uh, especially with regard to compromising a nuclear plant. So these are some differences that we want to try to explore a little bit further. We're hopeful that if we can get data from a variety of different countries, we can run those same models and see what else might work. So with that having been said, does anyone have any questions? I don't know how we're doing on time. Uh, was it made obvious that Bagaria is a fake country? No, we did not specifically state this is a fictitious nation. Now, perhaps that might affect the outcome, but we thought that this was far enough off that individuals would say, I've never heard of Bagaria, and maybe would say nothing, or at least would recognize this is probably not a real place. Any other questions? 